Hello, welcome to week three, unit two, what are dictionaries? Before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to my friends from the SAP community and the SAP Insight Tracks around the world using this mug I once got at the SAP Insight Track in the Netherlands. So let's start. So far, we have worked with lists and tuples. But what are the drawbacks of lists and tuples? In lists and tuples, it's only possible to access the individual elements using an index. This can be sometimes a little bit cumbersome. As an example, consider a telephone book. In a telephone book, you don't want to look for the third entry or the ninth entry. Instead, you want to search for the telephone number with a given name. And that's exactly what dictionaries are for. In dictionaries, we can look up elements using a key and all these elements can have a value. Just like in a telephone book where you have the key, the name, and the value, the telephone number. <clears throat> so how do dictionaries look in Python? Dictionaries consist of key value pairs. On this slide, I have a little screenshot of a dictionary from a Jupyter Notebook. The syntax for dictionaries is that they are marked by curly braces. Inside the curly braces, there are key value pairs which are separated by commas. And each key value pair is represented by a key, followed by a column, followed by a value. So in the example screenshots, for example, we have the key Paul McCartney and the corresponding value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In order to access the individual elements, we will use again square brackets, but instead of putting an index, we will put the key of the element. Dictionaries are mutable. We will see that it's possible to add elements, to delete elements, or to modify elements. And we will also see that trying to access a dictionary with a key that doesn't exist leads to an error. So after this introduction, let's head over to the Jupyter Notebooks and see how we can use dictionaries and Python. So I already talked about the introduction in the slides. Therefore, I will skip this in the Jupyter Notebook. And you see here, the dictionary I also had as a screenshot on the slide. So if I execute the cell, you see that we get as a result a dictionary and the dictionary marked by curly braces consists of different key value pairs. For example, here is a key value pair that has the key j.lennon and the corresponding telephone number. Once we have a dictionary, we can access the individual elements using the key. In our phone book example, that's the name. In order, for example, to get the telephone number of George Harrison, we would look up in our dictionary using the key George Harrison. And as mentioned before, we need to put this key into square brackets. If I execute the cell, you see, I get the telephone number of George Harrison. Accessing a dictionary using an index is not possible. If I, for example, try to access the third element in our dictionary phone book, I get an error. In this case, it's a key error. What's actually happening in the background is that Python looks in our dictionary if there is an element with a key two. And that's not the case, and therefore we get the key error. In fact, if we try to access any element by a non-accessing key, we will get an error. So for example, if I try to access our telephone book with the key p.best, I again get a key error. And the reason is that our dictionary simply does not contain a key p.best. As mentioned in the introduction, it's possible to change dictionaries. So it's, for example, possible to add new values. Adding new values is quite simple. We just 
put the syntax with the dictionary in square brackets a key and assign a value. For example, if we want to add the telephone number of Yoko Ono to our phone book, we would use this line. In order to add the telephone number of Brian Epstein, we can use this syntax. And if we execute the cell, we see that our dictionary now contains two new telephone numbers, namely the telephone number of Yoko Ono and Brian Epstein. So it's possible to add new values, new key value pairs to a dictionary. It's also possible to change existing values. So if, for example, Paul McCartney gets a new cell phone and therefore a new telephone number, it's easily possible to change the corresponding value of a dictionary. We would do this the same way we add new key value pairs. We just access the dictionary using the key and assign a new value. Let's give this a try and I modify the cell a little bit so that I can print um, the phone book before modifying the um, dictionary and after. And if I execute this little cell now, you see that beforehand the telephone number of Paul McCartney was 123456 and after the modification it's 654321. These were the basics of dictionaries and using keys to access the values in a dictionary. In our previous example, we always used the telephone book. In the telephone book, all keys were strings and all values were integers. However, this is not a requirement of dictionaries. In fact, it's possible to basically use all the data types we have learned about so far as values and most of the data types we have learned about so far as keys. Consider as an example the dictionary I have in my notebook down here. In this dictionary, we have all kinds of different data types as keys and values. There are integers, there are Boolean values, there is even a list as a value. And if I execute it, you will see that this in fact works. The only thing that's required for the key of a dictionary is that the key is immutable. There are certain data types in Python which are immutable, for example, integers, strings, and tuples. Um, but for example, lists are not immutable and therefore a list can't be a key. And I'll show you this with a simple example. I have here a new telephone book. In this new telephone book, the key consists of a tuple and the tuple has a first name and a last name. And if I use tuple as a key, this will work. If I try to do the same with a list that contains first name and last name, it won't be possible. So the first step works. I can indeed use a tuple as a key. The second example doesn't work. Here I get a type error, which tells me that the data type list can't be used. Most of the data types will work as keys but some won't be possible. And if you ever encounter this error, type error, unhashable type, that's probably the reason you used a data type as a key that it's not allowed. As mentioned, dictionaries are mutable. We can change the elements. We can also delete an element. We can use um, the delete keyword del to remove an element, for example, the telephone number of Paul McCartney from our telephone book. And if I do this and print the telephone book again, I get as a result a new dictionary which doesn't contain the telephone number of Paul McCartney anymore. So this covers the basic operations on dictionaries. The next thing we will have a look at is iterating over dictionaries. You already know that it's quite easy to use the for loop to process all the elements of a list or a tuple. 
The same thing is possible for a dictionary. We can use dictionary together with a for loop. And this is what I've shown here. Here you see for the name in our phone book, we want to do something. In this case, we print the name and the telephone number. And what this shows you is that iterating with the for loop through a dictionary gives you all the keys. All the keys are the name. And you can then use the key to access the elements of the dictionary, in our case, the phone book. So let's give this a try. And we see that we, as a result, get all the names and all the corresponding telephone numbers. In addition to the basic operations we've seen so far, there are quite a number of useful functions and methods for dictionaries. Um, for example, there is a length function. The length function returns the number of the keys in a dictionary. There is a keys method. The keys method returns all the keys of a dictionary, whereas the value method returns all the values. And there is even an items method, which returns all the key and value pairs from our dictionary as tuples. In our notebook, I have a test cell for each of these methods and functions I just showed you. For example, if we invoke the length function with our full book, we get as a result five. I won't go through all of them right now in detail. Please pause the video, test them yourself, and get a feeling for this function. What I want to do next is I want to talk a little bit about typical applications of dictionaries. In the following, I'll give you two examples where dictionaries can be very useful. In later unit, we will also show you when to use dictionaries, when to use lists, when to use tuples. Right now, just a few examples to actually where dictionaries can be useful. The first example is our famous student data. If you remember, we used to store student data in a list. Then the first element of the list was, for example, the name, the second was the first name, the third element was a subject, and so on. For this kind of structured data, dictionaries can be very useful. Instead of storing the information in a list, we can use a dictionary to store the information. For example, if we have the student Paul McCartney, we could store its information like this. We can store the name as a key value pair, the first name as a key value pair, the subject as a key value pair, and we can, for example, store the instruments he is able to play also as a key value pair. In this case, the value is a list. The advantage of this approach is that we don't need to remember at which position certain data is stored, like we ha would have to do with a list, and that it's also easily possible to extend the data. So for example, if we also want to store for a student his um, student number, we can simply add it, and it won't change the way we access the data because it doesn't change the index of any of the other fields. So dictionaries are quite useful to store structured data. A second example is whenever you have some kind of unique identifier. Think, for example, of a student number. A dictionary is quite useful. Each student has a unique identifier, and I can map this unique identifier using a key value pair to a student or the student data. In this case, in my example, I just use string, but you could use, again, a dictionary to store the complex student data or whatever data type is required. And this enables you to easily access certain students using their ID. For example, if I have here my students with their different IDs, I can, of course, print all the students, 
but I also can easily access a student with a certain ID. The ID in this case is 34567, and I think this should be George Harrison. Yes. So these are two examples where dictionaries are a useful data structure to represent data. So now it's again your turn. We have two exercises. The first exercise is to create a dictionary which contains translation between colors. The keys should be the English colors, for example, red, green, blue, and yellow. And the values should be the German translation, for example, rot, grün, blau, and gelb. And what you should do is that you should use the input function to ask the user for additional color and add it to our dictionary of translations between German and English. As always, it's your turn now. Pause the video, try to solve this exercise yourself, and I'll show you one possible solution later on. Welcome back. So, how can we solve this first exercise? What we need to do, we need to create a dictionary to translate colors. Um, I'll, let's call this dictionary English, German, German colors. And this dictionary should already contain certain values to start with. So red should be uh, translation for red is rot. Translation for green is grün. The translation for blue is blau. And the translation for yellow oops, that was a little mistake. And the translation for yellow is gelb. So the first thing I will right now do is to print this dictionary. And here we have our dictionary of translations between English and German. What we now need to do, we need to ask the user for a new color and add it to the dictionary. How do we do this? As always, we use the input function. So let's do this. Um, so the first thing we get is an English color. Please enter an English color and the German translation is the next thing we need to get. So please does the German translation. And the next thing we need to do is we need to add this to our dictionary. And we already know how this is done. We use the key, which is in our case the English color, and assign a certain value, in our case the German color, and this adds a new key to the dictionary. Let's give this a try. I'll add the print statement. Oops, that's wrong. I'll add the print statement to the very end. And let's see what this program does. First, I need to enter an English color. Let's use black. And now the term in translation is Schwarz. Oops, and I have a typo here. Ah, this is called colors and not color. So let's try this again. 
I need to enter an English color first, black. I need to enter an English color, uh, the German translation next, Schwarz. And now you see that our dictionary also contains the new key value pair, black, and a German translation, Schwarz. Again, this is just one possible solution. If your solution looks differently, it's most likely also correct. There are a lot of different ways to solve this exercise. That brings us to the second part of the exercise. The second part of the exercise is to now use the dictionary to translate. In the next step, you should ask the user for an input for a certain color in English and you should provide as an output the German translation. For example, which color should be translated? The user enters red, and the example output should be the German word for red is rot. Again, it's your turn. Please pause the video and try to solve the exercise yourself. So welcome back. Let's try to solve this exercise together. What do we need to do? We first need to get an input from the user. So the, the color that needs to be translated, which color should be translated? I'll simply copy the string to save me some typing. And the next thing we need to do, we need to print the translation. So print. The German word for, the German word for, the color that needs to be translated is, and what is a translation? We can simply use our dictionary to look up the translation. So, English German colors and in square brackets the color the user entered. So let's give this a try. Which color should be translated? Black. The German word for black is Schwarz. Let's try another one. Green. The German word for green is Grün. Let's try something else. If I now enter green with an uppercase, and in this case, we get a key error, which is of course correct, because if we look back up here, we defined the key to be all lowercase, so an uppercase green is not available in our dictionary. Of course, this is a little problem if you try to translate. You, know, you don't know if the user enters upper or lowercase letters. We will see a possible solution for this problem later on in the course. So that's it for the introduction to dictionaries. Let's head back to our slides. What have you learned in this unit? In this unit, you have seen how we can use dictionaries to access elements using a key and not an index. You have learned that the elements in the dictionary are key value pairs and that dictionaries are mutable. Therefore, it's possible to add new elements, to change elements or to delete elements from a dictionary. Thanks for watching and see you again in one of the upcoming units.